And welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the executive editor of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the first in the 2014 installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Real World Data Governance with Bob Siner. Today we'll be discussing a different way of defining data stewards and stewardship. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag RWDG, Real World Data Governance. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Bob Siner. Bob is the President and Principal of KIK Consulting and Educational Services and the publisher of the Data Administration Newsletter, TDAN.com. Bob has been a recipient of the DEMA Professional Awards for significant and demonstrable con contributions to the data management industry. Bob specializes in non-invasive data governance, data stewardship, and metadata management solutions. And with that, I will give the floor to Bob to introduce today's webinar. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much, Shannon. Thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your busy schedules. And there's a, you know, there's a lot of interest out there in data stewards and data stewardship. So I'm looking forward. I have been looking forward to um, this series, uh, to this installment of this series. So again, thank you for uh, the Real World Data Governance webinar series. As Shannon said, this is the first one of 2014. And if you keep checking back to diversity.net, you can find. Um, the subjects for the upcoming, actually for almost for the whole year. Pretty soon we'll be posting all the uh, the webinars for the full year. But certainly a lot of interest in data stewards and data stewardship. So, uh, Zach, hopefully uh, I'll say some things that will cause some interaction here. I'm, I'm curious as to what your thoughts are. There's a lot of organizations obviously putting governance programs in place, and typically data stewards and stewardship are a large part of the data governance programs. And there's a lot of different approaches, and the approach that you take in your organization really depends on uh, the way that governance is accepted into the culture of your organization. So I'm going to kind of show a little bit of a contrarian view to uh, a, a different way, as I say here, of defining data stewards and data stewardship. And I am very interested in your feedback on um, whether you believe that something like this would work within your organization. So ask questions, make it as interactive as possible. And, um, and like it here, at least, is a list of the next three, um, three webinars in this series. So February, we talked about a governance framework for success. And in fact, part of the presentation today will be used in that presentation as well, where I'm going to be talking about a framework for roles and responsibilities within an organization. And certainly data stewards and the stewardship of the, the data itself is a large part of a framework for success. The Agile Data Governance webinar in March, the, uh, the special guest has now been identified. Scott Ambler is going to join me, and we're going to talk about data governance and Agile philosophy, and it's always good for some interesting uh, statements, and uh, hopefully uh, a lot of you will attend that as well. And then in April, we're going to put together a, a webinar, which is how to write a data steward job description. So after I talk today about a different way of defining data stewards, a lot of people have interest in, well, how do we put together a job description of exactly what a data steward does within the organization and how we identify and recognize who those stewards are? So we're going to continue along this popular theme of data stewards and data stewardship in the April webinar. So looking forward to having you there as well. Uh, please take the time. I'd love to have you there. So um, I want to, as I usually do with my webinars, I, I start by talking about the abstract that I used to hopefully attract you to bring you here to this webinar. So here's the abstract. You know, most people will agree, most people at least in the data management and data governance and data, data professionals in general will get stewards basically sit at the core of a data governance program. So they're basically the glue that holds the governance program together. The role of steward is, is there's, it's different the ways in different organizations. So hopefully with this webinar here, I'm going to share with you uh, some things that will make you think about it, even other ways of being able to define how stewards and stewardship might work in your organization. So again, organizations run the gamut on how they define the role. What I really wanted to do here was uh, give you another way to look at the role altogether. So one of the things that I have been known to be saying recently 
is that essentially everybody within the organization has some level of steward responsibility. So therefore, potentially anybody in your organization could be a data steward. So the question I ask here is, what if everybody in your organization was considered to be a steward of the data they define, produce, and use? And that sounds uh, even more overwhelming probably than trying to put data governance together for a, a limited audience. The fact is that people within your organization, almost to a person, uh, as part of the daily job, they define, they produce, and they use data as part of their job. And management in most organizations would agree that we need to hold people accountable for how they define, produce, and use data. And if that's true, then we're really truly trying to formalize the accountability of these individuals across our organization. Then potentially everybody could be identified as being a steward. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to go out and tackle them in the hallway and tell them that they're a data steward and change their title and give them additional work to do. But one of the things that we do need to do is we need to educate these folks on the fact that they do have an impact on the quality and the usefulness of data throughout the organization. So whether they're, they're defining the data, and there's typically fewer people defining data than are who are producing data, and there's typically less people who are producing data than there are that are, are using the data, at least in some organizations that seems to be the case. Um, but there's almost to a person, people in the organization have some relationship to the data and one of the things that we need to do as part of governance, or at least as part of non-invasive data governance, is to educate them on the impact that they have on data across the organization. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about how do we define stewards in kind of a different way where we don't need to assign people or give them uh, specific titles that say they're data stewards, that almost anybody in the organization can be considered a data steward. So today's webinar is going to focus on these five things, basically a different way of defining the role of this steward, or perhaps it's similar to the way that you're doing it within your organization. And if that's the case, then please let me know that as well. So, uh, um, but the, you know, we talk about a different way of defining the role, and that there's different types of stewards in the organization. So obviously, every is not a decision maker associated with the data. But obviously, there's a lot of operational stewards and tactical stewards in the organization. We'll talk about a different way of engaging and operationalizing stewards. We're going to talk about ways of effectively communicating with them. You know, the simple message that you can share with your organization um, that will get the message across. Uh, the fact that we really need to formalize accountability and, uh, and and work that way with our governance program rather than hitting everybody over the head with a stick and calling data stewards and telling them that, that their, what their responsibility is, uh, what it's been in the past, that it's changing. So one of the first things I'd like to start with is my definitions of data governance and data stewardship. There are some organizations that use these terms interchangeably. I don't believe that that's really the right thing to do. So the way that I word data governance is obviously worded somewhat strong. That governance is the execution and enforcement of authority. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, when we're making decisions around data, we want to execute and enforce authority. That's not the definition I really want to focus on today. The, fo the definition I want to focus on today is the data stewardship definition. Data stewardship, to me, is the formalization of accountability to the management of data and data-related assets. So if you agree with these definitions, or if you have definitions of your own, again, I'd love to, to hear those as well. But if you agree stewardship potentially would be the formalization of accountability, that applies that there's already some level of accountability in your organization. I can recall a, a thing at a conference years ago, I was talking to a woman about her warehousing environment. She said, oh, we have no governance, we have no stewards. I started asking her questions about, well, on your, in your data warehouse, there's people that are defined, that have responsibility for defining the data that's going into your data warehouse or defining the data that's going to be in your MDM solution or your integrated databases or whatever it is that you're creating. So there are people there that have some level of accountability for defining data that goes into the data warehouse. There's people that are responsible for producing that data. And there's people responsible for how they use that data as well. And then if you think about it even further, go back to all of the operational systems, the, the, the uh, data systems in your organization where you're pulling data from to, to feed these integrated data sources. There's people that define, produce, and use that data as well. So typically in organizations, there is already some level of accountability. One of the things that we need to do is we need to understand who those people are. And we don't need to, again, go 
go over, go over to each of them and tell them that things are changing because they're now a steward of the data. That's not what I'm telling you at all. Actually, what I'm telling you is that they need to be made aware of the impact that they have on that data across the organization. So one of the things that I would suggest to you to do, or many of the things that I would suggest to you to do are on this page here. So per data resource in your organization, what the people are that are accountable for it? Who's defining the data? Who defined the data? Who who created a data model if there was a data model? Who validated the definitions of the data from the data that we purchased from a vendor? You know, who are the people that are accountable for the data per data resource? Who are the people in your organization that are the subject area experts or the subject matter experts? You know, find out who those people are. Maybe that doesn't exist across the enterprise, but that's going to be one of the things that we need to know in order to implement a successful governance program in our organization. Okay, the other questions like what value does improving enterprise view of data bring? I mean, these are all reasons for putting a governance program in place. But one of the things that I frequently hear is that the problems that we have as an organization is that nobody is accountable. And this is that typically some accountable at some level for the definition or the production or the use, or should I say the definition, production and use of the data. You know, if, if people say that there is no level of accountability, then this can't be being made. And if you say, well, that's one of the things that we have trouble with is making decisions, decisions are still being made. It's a matter of who's making those decisions. And if we can identify who the decision makers are around the different types of data, that helps us to identify who the stewards of the data are in the organization. So does your management think that nobody's accountable? I that your management think that somebody is accountable. And in some way, you be able to communicate with them and say, well, these people truly are the stewards, are the domain stewards, or the subject matter stewards of data across the organization. So is there an industry standard for what a data steward is? And if all, there's probably a lot of industry standards. I mean, it depends on the organization that you go to. You may have a different, a different definition for, how, for what a data stewardship is, how data stewardship operates within the organization, um, and so it's not necessarily a single industry definition for data storage. So some of the organizations may disagree and say their definition is the industry standard, but the truth is I've been exposed to a lot of organizations and there is no one way for organizations to identify stewards throughout. So the question then becomes, should there be an industry standard? I don't believe it's necessary. But at some point, there may be an industry standard that is written about or spoken about. But really, the definition of the data steward is going to be specific to your organization. So um, this is perhaps the most important slide of the whole slide deck. And I'm looking, I'm already seeing some of the questions that are coming in uh, regarding that if everybody's a steward, then nobody's a steward. Just like if everything's a priority, nothing is a priority. Well, we're going to address that in a couple of minutes as well. But this is a very important slide. So if you subscribe to the idea that a steward is a person that defines, produces, or uses data as part of a job, and therefore they should have some defined level of accountability or responsibility for assuring the quality of what they do with the data, again, whether it's a definition, production, or usage of data, that would be what I'm saying here is a different way of viewing a data steward. Perhaps everybody in the organization could be a steward. Do we need to engage them all exactly the same way? No, we don't. But we at least identify that people that are using data recognize that uh, they have some accountability for what they're doing with that data. So who is a data steward? A data steward can be anybody in the organization that defines, produces, or uses data if they're going to be held accountable. I don't know whether what your reaction is to, to kind of this definition to a data steward, but it, it's you're probably thinking, that, well, if we've only got a handful of data stewards and you're saying that everybody in the organization is a steward of the data, then it's just going to make my program that much bigger. And that's not necessarily the case. You know, maybe the communications with those people as to help them to understand what their responsibility is is around data. Maybe that's a little bit larger. Maybe that's a lot larger. And maybe you're not going to address every single person in your organization at once. But I see this, that one of the clients that I'm working with recently um, is building this into the orientation in their organization. So when it comes on board, they understand that they have some level of accountability 
and they're going to keep record of what data they define, produce, and use so that we can communicate them with them more effectively. So, for example, a risk or a compliance rule changes. We don't want to guess who we need to tell that to. Or if there's a change to a business role, we don't want to guess who that gets communicated to. What we want to do is we want to know specifically who those individuals are. And one of the things I'm going to share with you in a couple minutes here is a, uh, a way of being able to collect that information. And that information is basically metadata. You know, when you think about it, it's data about data, but it's really data about the people that are associated with the data in your organization. If you were an attendee of a real-world data governance um, webinar that I gave last year of data stewards, and it was relatively early in the year. One of the things that I talked about is what I called at the time signers' rules for becoming a data steward, and I've since kind of renamed it to be non invasive rules for becoming a data steward. But the idea was that I would, again, start a little bit of controversy around you know, this different way of viewing a data steward. I didn't start any controversy at all. In fact, everybody that responded to me um, had said to me that. They were completely bought in to the idea that, you know, perhaps everybody in the organization needs to be accountable to some degree or another um, for, for what they do with the data that they define, produce, and use. So a data steward can be anybody. Being a data steward describes a relationship, and it's not necessarily a position. I mean, there are organizations that have a title of data steward, but not necessarily all organizations go that route. Um, a steward is not hired to be a steward, as I said. A steward would be anybody in the organization. So we're not necessarily hiring you in to be a steward, but we're hiring you in to do a specific job. And along with that job comes some level of accountability for what you do with the data. I mean, to me, it seems to make common sense. If you disagree with me, please let me know that. I would love to hear that from you as well. But a data steward does not have to have the title of a data steward. It doesn't have to be told how to do their job. You know, that thing, a data steward, is, if a data steward can be anybody, yes, they have to be told how to do their job, but they don't have to be told how they do their data steward job. Um, public industry, and because they don't have to be told how to do their job, I'm not a believer in the fact that public or industry data steward certification is a good thing. I think that we can certify stewards within our organization as to what their full accountability is. But I think that sending somebody out to a class to teach them how to be a data steward is necessary. Now, again, some people may disagree with me, and some people may agree with me, but that's just the way that I view things. There's more than one data steward for each type of data in our organization. And, uh, and when I show, share with you some of the tools that I use for collecting that information, you'll see exactly what I mean. We need to know the fact that there's 10 different people in 10 different parts of the organization that are defining the same data. Well, when we have some make some decisions around that data, we should know who they are so we can get them involved in the conversations. And again, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to share with you a tool that I think may help you to be able to do that. Um, stewardship training really should focus, again, on formalizing accountability within the organization rather than trying to get it from somebody from the outside. You're not telling them how to do their job. We're just telling them how they're going to be held accountable for what we do with the data that they work with. So again, there was a webinar Dave, that went into each of those items, each of those eight items, I believe, in detail. There's also an article on TDN called Signers Rules for Defining a Data Steward that goes into a little bit more detail about each of those eight points. So with the non-invasive data governance rules for becoming a data steward, you may not agree with all of them. You may not agree with any of them. Um, in fact, I have been told, as, uh, as somebody has told me even through chat here, that, that this basically a do-nothing approach. You know, if everybody's a data steward, nobody's a data steward. I'm not that at all. It, I think the same thing applies uh, with data governance and data stewardship as does with priorities. And like if you have, if it's a top priority, nothing's a top priority. But if everybody in the organization is a data steward, and though they may not be identified or told that they're a data steward, they do need to know how what they do with the data impacts people across the organization. So basically, it's not a do-nothing approach. In my mind, it's more of a do-everything approach. If we're about everything being everyone in the organization, we need to make sure that the program that we define effectively can communicate with people across the organization. It's one of the reasons that I talk about the need for a communications plan when you're developing a data governance program is because there's a lot of communicating that needs to be done. And you need a plan for how you're going to be 
be able to do that. And you need to have a place for people to uh, to come to to uh, to look at. Um, to understand why they have been given a certain level of responsibility because what they do impacts the data. If they take the data and load it on a jump drive and take it off site and that data becomes stolen, they're accountable for that. You should know that they're not allowed to do that. That's just a simple example of just letting people know what they can and can't do with data that they work with. So basically there's three approaches. So you know, typically well, organizations approach how they identify stewards in different ways. There's the non which is the one that I've been talking about so far and the one that I'll, that I'll continue to talk about. Identify people into roles rather than assigning people into roles. Um, actually did work with one of the armed forces in the U.S. and they said, let's recognize people into roles. And so I like that the word recognize as much as I like the word identify people into roles. Let's leverage their existing responsibilities in whatever way we can um, within the organization. So if there's three ways to move forward with how we're going to go about defining stewards, I think that this number, the first one is the one that makes the most sense to me and is most practical in a lot of organizations. The third approaches to defining stewards are the command and control approach and the two by four approach. Well, so command and control approach is something that I hear from so many organizations about how we're going to change what people do and we're going to assign them into to roles, we're going to give them these new responsibilities, and then they wonder why there's a lot of pushback in the organization. Well, the fact is the reason why there's pushback is because everybody's so darn busy to begin with. In most organizations, if you ask anybody, if they're not fill 100% to capacity, um, they're, first of all, they'll never, they'll never do that. But the fact is the people are at 125%. 150%. And if you come to them and say you're a data steward and we're going to give you all these additional responsibilities, they're going to push back. If you tell them that we're going to formalize how they get involved in data projects, then that's a little bit different of an approach than kind of that command and control approach. The approach is the two by four approach, and that's like a two by four of wood where you go and you, uh, somebody told me, you know, I think I need to change this slide because I think that's a two foot by four foot approach rather than a two inch by four inch piece of wood. But the, the, the idea still applies. I guess if you're going to hit something in the head of the two foot by four foot piece of wood, that's going to hurt as well. But, you know, we don't want to go around bashing people over the head and telling them governance is not optional and that you have to make time for this. Rather, what I would like to do is, is have them say, you know what, you're already doing this to a certain degree. And we'll help you to formalize that. We're going to help you to do it better. And you yourself are going to see some return on that rather than, um, rather than saying, no, we're going to change everything that you do and how to do it. And here, here for uh, in the future, we're going to start calling you a data steward. Well, you know, don't necessarily need to take that approach within your organization. I don't suggest that you take the second or third approach. So one of the things that we want to do is we're defining data stewards. We want to remove all of the obstacles to them accepting their steward responsibilities. I mean, if they have the option of saying yes, they're a steward, or no, they're not a steward, you know, that's a little bit different than saying we're recognizing you as a steward because of your relationship to the data, because of what you do with the data. So what are typical responses to the roles that are defined in organizations? Well, I'm not going to go through them one by one, but, you know, people are concerned about all of those things that I have listed on the screen in front of you, you know, getting, getting too much responsibility, stepping on people, you know, those types of things. But one thing that I would like you to consider in, in this approach to defining stewards is the thing, this opportunity that we have to remove obstacles to accepting steward responsibilities. And so not giving them something that's going to be new, they're not really in a position where they need to accept it or not accept it. But if your management says that somebody produced data, they need to be held accountable for how they produce the data, that's different. That's an opportunity. That's an opportunity in your organization to take your steward responsibilities and let people know exactly what is expected of them. Very different way of defining stewards. You know, and one of the other questions I have is why is it important for us to define the role of the data steward and what their responsibilities are. And again, typically, if you're an organization that I've worked with in the past or hopefully will work with at some point in the future, there are four primary things that typically get delivered when a when a governance program is delivered. It is, you know, best practice, critical analysis, how close are we to what we say we want to, how we want to behave when it comes to governance, that operating model of roles and responsibilities, which includes the information about the steward role responsibilities. You can build an action 
plan. You can't build a communication plan if you don't very clearly define what the role responsibilities are that go along with your um, with your governance program and certainly your stewards. So typically the backbone of the program becomes that definition of rules and responsibilities. And it certainly begins at least with the uh, the data steward. And I'm going to tell you now about a couple different types of stewards that exist within organizations. Um, I did want to let you know, again, that the next webinar in this series on February 20th is about a, an operating model of roles and responsibilities, where I go into a lot of detail about, um, about the roles themselves, about the roles of the stewards, but also the role of the council and the role of IT and the role of the data governance team and the data governance partners. Please, if you have time, attend the session next month. It's going to be interesting where I dissect a couple of the things that I'm going to show you here in the upcoming slide. So, so typically it becomes very important that we define these roles. And this is really the framework that I'm going to talk about in the next presentation. And you may have seen it in the past in the webinars that I've given in the past, but it's very complex. It looks like there's a lot of different type of levels of things. But the truth is, if you look on the far outsides of the diagram where it says this exists or we need to leverage this, organization never, never on there do you see that any of these things are new to your organization. You may already have a group that you can use as your council. You may already have subject matter experts that you can use as your domain stewards. Your operational stewards, as we've already talked about, they already exist in the organization. They're defining, producing, using data as part of their job. So what we're going to focus on today in the balance of the hour that we have is this part in the block area. We're going to talk about the data domain stewards, steward coordinators, uh, and the operational data steward. So let me get to that real quickly. First thing that I want to say, actually, um, one of the things that I want to say is that we need to recognize that there are multiple different types of stewards with the organization. So the operational stewards, the lower part of that pyramid diagram that I just showed, and then there's people that are, are have more responsibility. Rather than just responsible for doing their job, they have enterprise responsibility around the data, rather than, like I said, specific just within their business unit. So you have the operational data stewards that work within a business unit, have hands-on knowledge, they define, produce, and use data associated with their jobs. You have data domain stewards, at least that's what I call them. I've seen organizations call them enterprise data stewards or subject matter experts, or it's a lot of different names for them. Um, but the people that have the ability to facilitate resolution of issues obtaining to that domain or subject area of data. And in some organizations, the people at this level, the tactical level of that pyramid diagram that I showed you, they have decision-making authority. Sometimes they don't. Um, there's the data steward coordinators that aren't really truly data stewards, but the steward coordinators. And I'll talk about them a little bit in a couple minutes here when we dissect that middle part of the framework that I just showed you a second ago. So if you've been an attendee of my webinars in the past, this probably looks very familiar to you, and I talk about it all the time, and it's a very valuable tool to most organizations, is the common data matrix, where the idea is that we are going to cross-reference in our organization the different parts of the organization, information technology, corporate units, business units. We're going to cross-reference those with the different data that we have in the organization. As you can see here, we have customer data, the audience data, and customer data has subdomains of data, and each of the subdomains exist in multiple systems, and in each of the different parts of the organization, there's people that define, produce, and use that data, and one of the things that I suggest is we need to know who those people are. So the common data matrix becomes a very valuable tool, and in fact, the, actually more important than just the top or the left side of this diagram is this part that I highlighted in, in kind of a greenish color, which is if we know who does what with data across the organization, or if we at least know what parts of the organization are finding and producing and using the data, then it becomes very valuable to us as a tool for communication about that data. So not only that, the IT area, we need to know who are the data subject matter experts, the system subject matter experts for each of those different different systems, for each of the different data. So one of the things that we need to do to get started is to inventory who does what with data across our organization. So you've probably seen the common data matrix before. I'd love to hear from you if people, if you guys use the, the common data matrix within your organization. The fact is the common data matrix preferences with the pyramid tool that I shared 
shared a couple slides ago by color. So if you see here where we have the operational stewards at the bottom of the pyramid, here's where we have them within the organization. Here where we have IT, well, there be IT within a business unit or there could be IT as a centralized IT. And again, most of the colors are represented and there's a pretty fair cross reference from one tool to the other. But certainly this middle piece right here that I talked about, the tactical level, is this over here on the common data matrix. One of the things that we need to do to identify uh, in our organization, or to identify in our organization who has the accountability to make decisions. And if we just agree to disagree and go on a merry way every given time, then we're, um, we're not gonna solve anything. So ultimately that middle part of the pyramid diagram becomes the most important part of the data government. Actually, as I've stated well uh, many, many times to people is that it is the hurdle that most organizations need to get over in order to successfully implement their data governance program. If they identify those domain stewards or whatever they call them at the tactical level, that becomes a big step in being successful in an organization. So, real quickly, with the next couple of slides, because very quickly time is going to run out here, an hour is only so much time to, to go into all the details that I wanted to share with you. If you're interested in, in pursuing the conversation after the webinar, please again reach out to me, reach out to Shannon. I'd um, love to talk about that as well. But I want to run through some of the responsibilities of those operational data stewards. So, again, these are the people within the organization that basically use data to data, produce data as part of their jobs. So they have responsibility for defining data that will be used. Uh, those are data definers, if you're gonna break it down to definers, producers, and users. People who produce data are the producers. People that use data are the users. Um, all of these folks are responsible for the integrity of what they do with the data in the organization. So additionally, the, the responsibility of the operational stewards may be to create or review data definitions of uh, these things that I say are important for the operational data stewards to do doesn't mean you need to give them a list and say, hey, now you're responsible for these things. These are things that they do as part of their job. And if they don't do these things, we don't need to add these things to their job, but we do need to make sure that the operational data stewards are represented in their interests across the organization. Those last two bullets on this slide are extremely important. We do need the operational data stewards, these people that day-to-day -day define, produce, and use data. We do need them to communicate new or changed business requirements to people that can, can help to influence change. We need to communicate concerns, issues, and problems with the data to people that can influence change. We need to know who these people are, so we need to record it. And again, we don't need to necessarily know every single person. You need to be a multinational organization with uh, with, with entities across the globe, and you have to know every single person's name in every part of the organization that defines, produces, and uses data. The answer is no way. If I told you that you needed to do that, you would have told me that I was crazy. But you do need to know that there are people in these different parts of the organization that are defining, producing, or using data. So when there's changes or when there's things that get updated, we can communicate with those folks effectively. So we need to at least define some responsibilities of data stewards so that we'll go out and tell people, well, you know what, you're, um, since you define the data, we're going to educate you on how, what it really takes to define the data. Or if you're going to produce the data, um, but having the same zip code in for every single customer that comes through the store does not necessarily add value the way that it, it is supposed to in the organization. Uh, you know, it's as, again, as an example of what an operational steward may do. Uh, they're responsible, so this is, I love this slide, so they, they're responsible for doing what is expected of them in their job while being felt, held formally accountable for how they do it. And in fact, I thought that was so important that I put it twice. <laughs> so they are, again, responsible for doing what is expected of them in their job, but held formally accountable for how they do it when it comes to data. So the question then becomes, what do we mean by formally accountable? How do we hold people formally accountable for what they do with the data. Talk about that for a second. For accountable, there's a, a bunch of different ways organizations do that. They do it through performance evaluation, which is really invasive. It's a way, again, to make certain that people are following what they're being told to do with data or how they're supposed to act with the data. We can assign responsibilities, which is also invasive. What a lot of organizations do is create sign-offs along the way through projects. 
to make that we've engaged the right people at the right time to do the right thing with the data. So we, we want to define the stewards in a way, and we want to define, we want to make sure that we can hold them fully accountable, again, for how they, how they act with the data. So one of the things we want to do is we want to put it in the forefront of people's consciousness, basically, that what they do with the data has an impact on the organization. And we want to explain to them what that impact is and how, if in fact they're going to be held formally accountable through any of these means, you know, what exactly does that mean to them with their job performance? Abilities of the domain stewards, again, to speed up a little bit here, but I want to just give you an idea that, again, they have responsibility for a subject matter of data across the organization. The fact is, some of these people probably already exist in the organization. We need to identify who they are and, and write them down. They're responsible for escalating issues. They're responsible for documenting the rules or making sure the rules are documented in the organization for the data. The steward coordinators, again, they don't necessarily sit down in a position where they have accountability for, well, I mean, if everybody's a data steward, they would be a data steward as well. But their role in a data governance program is to coordinate the activities of the stewards. Again, and please take some time to read through the definitions of these roles when we share the slides with you. Um, it's not the topic of the presentation here, but again, talking about the different roles associated with the stewards in the organization, we can't forget about the data steward coordinators. Typically, that's a role in an organization doesn't ha necessarily have any say in, in matters, but can help us to make sure that communication takes place and that we get the stewards, the right stewards involved at the right time. So a couple of different questions that I've seen from organizations when they've gone out and they've engaged their students, and I actually, actually get a chuckle out of this when I, uh, when I say this to a group of people, but I had a very large client say to me, how many stewards are we going to need? How long are we going to need them for? I'll talk about that in a second here, because when you get questions like that, um, it, it's an opportunity to educate people within your organization as to what a steward is and how a steward operates and how we identify who those stewards are. The question really becomes, again, how will we identify the stewards, recognize the stewards? How will we, you know, you can fill in the blank, basically. Uh, but we want to treat our stewards well, obviously, right? So we want to identify them. We want to recognize them. We don't really want to assign them. We do activate them, and that's what I'm going to spend the balance of the time talking about, is how do we activate these stewards and engage the stewards once we've found them. But you get questions like that, like how many stewards do we need, and how long are we going to need them for? The way I answer that question is, that how long do we need to have quality data for? Well, if we have quality data, then we always need to have somebody who's accountable for that data. And therefore, we can approach governance in a non-invasive way. And certainly, the way that we identify our stewards and engage the stewards is solely dependent on the approach that we take within our organization. So now that we've defined what a steward is, we need to define what a steward does. And I already said, basically, a steward does what a steward does. You know, but in, when they're participating in the role of being a data steward um, actively in a project or a program or, or some initiative within the organization, we need to be able to articulate to them what it is that we are expecting from them in that role. So we do it proactively, and we can do it reactively. Proactively, proactively, we want to build governance into what the stewards already do. So to do that is that there's several ways to do that, to build it into your project management capabilities, but also to create things like governance activity matrices, RACI charts, SLCs, and those types of things. One of my pet peeves, and I talk about it quite often, is that I don't like it when people call things data governance processes. Because as you start calling things data governance processes, people start blaming the processes on data governance. The fact is what we're really doing is we're applying governance to existing processes or to new processes that are being defined. And if you call things data governance processes, you can expect that people are going to look at and say, well, governance is telling me that I need to do X, Y, and Z. Well, that's not really the fact. The fact is that the process is the, what the process is, and we want to be certain that we get, again, the right person involved at the right time to make a decision and all those things associated with governing data throughout those projects. And one of the things that we want to do is we want to build governance into what they do rather than trying to tell them that the majority of what they're doing is going to change. So right here again, I wanted to share real quick with you the, the concept of non-invasive governance. 
that you give employees new job titles, you recognize the majority of their work isn't going to change. You're going to identify, recognize, and engage them. The idea is that we're not going to um, put walls between people and the data. We're going to actually tear down some of the brick walls between the people and the data. So, again, the idea of staying non invasive in your approach. So, what exactly does a steward do? They do what's expected of them in their job of being held formally accountable for how they do it. And uh, again, don't call them data governance processes. One of the things I want to do is share with you here, while well, a few minutes left, some of these matrices, just so you can see how it's worked within other organizations, and perhaps you can take something away from it as to that this may help you um, with your organization. So here's an example of a governance activity matrix. matrix. Um, if you define the roles and responsibilities for governance around your organization, and you define the steps of a methodology or something that you're following, and then you can define out each of these different steps, get involved in each, or I'm sorry, each of these different roles, roles get in, involved in each of the different steps. Now you're starting to formalize the activity of these individuals within the organization. Now I know this is pretty relatively small. But it's difficult to uh, uh, somewhat difficult to read, but the concept isn't necessarily what's inside the blocks. The concept is again, we're going to find the roles and responsibilities that pyramid that we just talked about, and cross-reference it with the steps of a process, and they find specifically what gets done. And there are several different variations on this that I will share with you here quickly before we wrap up. So here's another example of that. This is if you're familiar with RACI, responsible accountable consulted, informed. And here's an example from an organization I worked with where here they defined the civic um, procedures and processes that they wanted to apply governance to. Again, we're not calling them governance processes, but we want to apply governance to each of these things, resolve issues, identify and monitor risk, you know, all of these types of things. And they may be different for your organization, but again, what we're doing here is we're talking how are we going to engage these data stewards? And so the idea is then that for each of those different activities, we define steps and we define the roles and we say who's accountable, who's responsible, who's consulted, who's informed. You know, we build that into the process and we educate people on what that process is. Again, it's not building something new. It's not being very invasive. What it is is, and it may be new to your organization to apply governance to a process, but it's a less invasive to do it that way than it is to try to redefine the processes that you need in, in your organization. Another example here of, of engaging the data stewards in a process, and this one was for structuring uh, a AI environment, and they had here are the different steps they're going to follow. Here are the different roles associated with governance across the organization. And again, they just cross, this is how they engage the stewards within their organization. Define what they were supposed to do, how long it would take. You know, time should elapse. So again, it's a way of going from informal governance and informal involvement of people to more of a formal way through these, uh, these types of matrices. Another example. Uh, the first, this is one for an example of a master data certification process. Here's the steps. Here's the roles. Again, color coded with the pyramid diagram in, in your organization. That may be very helpful for people to be able to match up who does what and what, what and how and when they get involved, and who's responsible, accountable. Again, what we do is just look at the roles of the, of the organization with the steps of a process, and we define who's going to be responsible, who's going to be concerned, and who's going to be informed, all of those types of things um, in the organization. It's going from less formality to more formality, and it's in a non-invasive way, basically. So that's proactive. You kind of build it into your process. Well, the same thing kind of holds true for reactive as well. Where we qualify and prioritize issues. So we may have a process that we follow to solve problems. And your process may look something like this. It may look something like something completely different. But the, the fact is that there's a process to solve problems. And if you can do the same type of thing, is take the steps that you follow to resolve an issue and take the different roles that you've identified for governance across your organization, you can formalize how you go about resolving data issues in a much more, like I said, more, much more of a formal way that you can demonstrate to people the value that it's adding to your organization. So, again, we were talking about defining stewards, stewards in a different way, just involving them the way they should be. Now, 
again, it may sound like you're doing nothing. Well, the fact is, no, you're not doing nothing. You're you're doing everything. You're getting the right people involved at the right time. And one of the things that you need to do in order to do that is to recognize who they are and to, to make sure that you record them and then actively engage them um, throughout the different processes that are being governed within your organization. So what I'd like to do, uh, I'd like to wrap up here um, and then take some questions. I see that there are a bunch of questions, uh, so I want to leave some time for that. But these are some important messages for communicating to your management. Um, and in a lot of presentations that I've given, one of the first questions that I ask the people that are in attendance is, how many of your organizations are doing data governance? And some, uh, you know, some people raise their hands, some people don't raise their hands, some hands go up just a little bit, you know, yeah, we're kind of doing data governance. And then I turn to them and say, you know what, I'm going to ask the same question again, and I want you all to raise your hand. The kind of puzzled looks, and I, and I ask the question again, and everybody raises their hand, Say, well, the fact is, there is already some governance taking place within your organization. There are people in your organization that have levels of accountability for how they define, produce, and, and use data. They're just not necessarily being held formally accountable for how they do it. Therefore, it becomes the Wild West. Therefore, we become spreadsheet heaven and access database heaven and SharePoint heaven, where people can just enter, create anything that they want. There's no formal way of governing the data in a lot of organizations. But we know that we already govern data for specific applications. What we need to do is we need to take that and take advantage of that in other parts of the organization as well. So you're already governing data. We can formalize how we govern data by putting structure around what we're doing. We improve these things. You know, we don't have to spend a ton of money in order to put a data governance program in place. But what we do need to do is we need to have a plan. We need to have a way to go about it, and we need to have some resources that are actually associated with putting the program together. Because if you don't have that, you don't have a program, basically. But we don't have to spend a ton of money on governance. Um, so going to the outside for help, I would certainly recommend that. Um, but the idea is that it's not as though you can buy a piece of software and put it in place and therefore have a governance program. It doesn't work like that. We're, what we're doing is we're really focusing on changing the behavior of people. We're focusing on changing the behavior of the stewards. We need structure, and that's really what the non-invasive approach is all about. The other messages that I wanted to share here real quickly before we take some questions is that data governance doesn't have to be a huge challenge. So communicating to your management for whatever part of the organization that you have some influence over or that you are, have, been at, have been tasked this for. You, know, you don't want to go to people and tell people how large of a challenge data governance is and that it's going to be expensive and it's going to be complex. If you go to them and say, we don't need a technical solution, we really need to put a framework around what we're presently doing, and we need to define stewards in such a way that it's going to make sense to people that people aren't threatened by being made stewards within their, organ within their part of the organization. So these messages for management, again, the ones that I had on the previous page and on the page here, they're valuable to your organization. If you tell them it's going to be a huge challenge, that's what they're going to believe. And that's what, if you go to them and say, you know, we're already doing this, but we can put some formality around it, it's a much different tack to take with what that level. And if you tell them we don't have to spend a boatload of money on this, they're going to like that even better. But you're really not governing the data itself. You're governing people's behavior that's associated with the data. And that's something that uh, that seems to make sense for our organizations. So the last thing that I want to share you with here before we take some questions is something that I shared at my last data diversity uh, conference that I spoke at was uh, the Data Governance Bill of Rights. Um, one thing to share here is that I'm, I'm also presenting on this topic at the Data Governance Conference in uh, San Diego in June. So I'm pretty sure that I will be speaking of that. And actually, the, the, this presentation goes into even more depth uh, for each of the roles, because an hour's time is relatively quick to kind of go through all of this. But I shared this kind of a poster with people at the um, at the State of Governance Conference, where people came to me and said, you know what, that kind of nails it. That's exactly what we're trying to do with governance, is we're trying to get the right people involved at the right time, in the right way, using the right data to make the right decision, to lead to the right decision, at least most of the time, within an organization. And those matrices that I shared with you, the common data matrix, the governance activity matrix, those will help you to put your arms around who does what with data across your organization. And then hopefully, 
help you to move forward with your governance program uh, even better in 2014 than it was in 2013. To wrap up here real quickly and then turn it back over to Shannon. Um, these are the webinars that I have coming up in the next several months. Talk more in detail about the governance framework that I'm going to share in this, uh, in this webinar. Uh, February, in March, Scott Ambler will be with me to discuss agile data governance, and we'll get good feedback from people as to how they view the comparison or the relationship between agile and data governance. In April, we're going to talk about how to write a data steward job description. I'm always interested in your um, ideas about the topic, so please share them with me or share them with, uh, with Shannon and share them with Dataversity. And with that, Shannon, I would like to turn it back over to you for questions. Okay, we have a lot of questions coming in. And don't be, uh, you know, I know we only have 10 minutes here, but don't be shy about submitting your questions. One of the great things about this particular series is Bob will write up answers uh, to those questions. And of course, the most popular question is, will um, you be receiving a copy of the slides? So I will be sending out a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides uh, of this presentation as well as the recording. We've also had a request, Bob, for the um, data governance matrix. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and, and so, be, uh, so we'll get that all out to you again by end of day Monday. So let me start with the questions. Again, a lot of great questions that have come in, Bob. But if the idea of data stewardship is still pretty new within the organization, even organizations that have taken data governance seriously, do you not think in this environment people designated as data stewards are important? Well, things that the people are important. Anybody who does anything with the data should be important to the organization. And you talked about designating stewards in, the, in that question. Um, if, if it's not, not a concept that's, that's known within your organization, then certainly you need to address it. You need to educate people. But how you go about educating them be uh, what determines whether or not your program is going to be successful or not. So if you go to them and say, hey, we're going to assign you, we designate you as a steward, and here's all the additional things that you need to do besides for all the work that you already do in the short amount of time that you have to do it, um, they're really not very receptive to that, or should I say they're just not, not going to receive that well. But if you go to them and say, you know, tell me where you're having problems with the data. Tell me where you need help. Where are things that we can formalize? Where can we have an impact? What can you do with the data that you would like to do? All these questions are really important. It makes people feel that they're important. And that was the end of the question that you had was they want to make people, these people are all very, very important. So I'm not minimizing the importance of a single steward. What I'm actually doing is I'm trying to emphasize the importance of every steward. And, and we need to identify questions or identify the communications that we can share with those individuals to let them know they're important and let them know they have an impact. The next question is, who would be responsible to define legal holds involving SOX, FTC regulations around PCI, PI, USP regulations, data retention, et cetera, et cetera? <laughs> a lot of acronyms for, like, this for the same question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try to address that. So, you know what? There is somebody in your legal department who should be able to answer that question. Who responsibility for making certain that those rules are defined and communicated? You made my case for me. I mean, you need to communicate all of those things, the PI, the PCI, all those different things need to be communicated to even just the, the most random user of that data. Because you expect them to follow the rules if we don't educate them on what those rules are. So I would say somebody within the legal area should be able to tell you who has the accountability for making certain that those rules are documented but it becomes the uh, the job of the data governance team to actually work with the organization and to educate them on what those rules are and how we're going to monitor whether those rules are being followed or whatever it is that you put in place. But certainly involve your legal team. And like I said, yeah, I think you made a case for the fact that you know you've got all these different compliance rules. Everybody needs to be held accountable. Forms need to be held accountable. In large company with an immature data governance program, do you think it, there is a role for named and trained people to function as ambassadors and educators to reach more people than DG can reach directly until the culture change takes root? You know what? I think that's a great idea, and it's, it's not something that I've thought of before. Is that, is that yes, you need to identify people that can be your ambassadors, especially in a large company. 
the idea of being able to train those people on what governance is all about so that they can share the word is a lot different than trying to, to do a, every single person in the organization as to what they do. So I love that idea. I mean, I think that actually, whoever sent that question in, contact me. I'd love to talk to you about it. Even But it makes a lot of sense to have those ambassadors out to your organization who are educated on, on the program and can really help to extend the reach of the data governance team. Great question. Another question for you is, in this uh, Internet age, a lot of the data produced by external customers, who do you think should be responsible for, that qual for the quality of that data? That's a, that's a great question. So if you don't have the ability to dictate to your partners who, who what the quality of their data needs to be, and you're getting the data in from the outside, um, actually the, the accountability starts as soon as the data hits the doorstep of your company. Somebody needs to be then validating the data to make sure that it's what it says it's supposed to be, that the values are there, all of those types of things. But you know, people recognize that if they don't have influence over people outside the company, it's very hard to be able to tell them what they need to do and what the data needs to look like. Some of the larger corporations have that clout to be able to do that. Some of the larger hospital networks have that with their hospitals to be able to tell them what they need to do, um, what they need to do around the data. Um, in the way that the data needs to look. Um, so it becomes very important that we um, that we get those folks all involved in understanding, um, you know, the, the impact that they have, again, across the organization. How do you identify what data needs to be governed? Is it better to start with a data concept or data item within a subject area? Uh, don't see how it can be applied as a first step to an entire subject area. <laughs> That's a great question. You know, the fact is that you can't get all your data in the same way all at once. You've got to do it incrementally. The way I always put it is, is that it's um, it's to be an evolution. It's not going to be a revolution. You're going to come into your organization and say, how do you pick the best data? You know, in a lot of organizations, they reach out and they touch the low-hanging fruit. I mean, they go to the data issues that they know are causing problems where there are people who want those problems to be solved. And they formalize how they solve the problem, and then they formalize the solving of the problem. And use, you know, use that as their, their way, again, to, to, uh, to demonstrate in the organization. You can't go the data across the organization. You start with an application of the data, which, again, can be large. You can start with a domain of the data. Um, you can start with a specific system. Them. There's a lot of different ways to start, but my suggestion is start small and be incremental and don't do it as a revolution. Try to do it as an evolution. And as you're learning, again, I've, I've shared this before in my webinars where somebody told me at one point, don't let perfection get in the way of good enough. You know, let's put a program in place and let's, let's start working on specific issues and let's not be afraid to change the course, how governance is working within your organization if, in fact, it's not working the way that you want it to work. So start small, be incremental, don't be afraid to change. I mean, that's the way that I would suggest. And, and if you have low-hanging fruit, you have that first because it, you can you know, demonstrate your value quickly by solving problems. And we have time for just one more question, but again, if you want to submit additional questions, we'll be sure to get those written answers to you in the follow-up email. Um, so last question, Bob, with respect to data governance within a federated organization, what techniques in the data stewardship areas can be used to help the organization move away from data being managed in application silos to en enterprise repositories with defined processes? Uh, you didn't try to memorize that question and repeat that back to me. That's a long question. I know. <laughs> <laughs> With respect to federated organizations, well, um, there are different techniques. Again, you're not going to start out by addressing the entire federation, so to speak. I mean, you're going to start in certain areas, and you're going to, again, if you can collect information about who's what with the data and identify who the, the present decisions makers are, it will work the same in a federated organization as with a non federated organization. And certainly the idea is to move away from managing the data in the specific, uh, as you said, in the application silos. Um, you want to move towards an enterprise, uh, uh, enterprise definition of the data. Well, you're not going to get to an enterprise definition of the data without some level of governance. Whether you call it governance or you call it something else, I mean, there's got to be some way, there's got 
got to be some accountability. There's got to be a way of being able to make decisions. So I would say that with respect to a federated organization, again, you got to do it incrementally. And you got to have a plan. And, and again, don't be afraid to change. And that's all we have time for, I'm afraid. Um, but again, thank you everybody so much for these fantastic questions. I just, uh, it's my favorite part of any of any session and I just love how involved everyone gets. And Bob, thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. It's, it's really uh, uh, been a great change to the way we're thinking about data stewards and stewardship. So that's just always a good thing to help the industry move forward and challenge our thinking. And um, thanks everyone, I hope everyone has a fantastic day. And I'll get the follow-up email out to you with links to the slides, the recording, the answers to the question, and the matrix asked for by end of day Monday for you. And then I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you very much, Shannon. Thank you, everybody. We'll hope to see you again sometime. Thanks. Bye.